Welcome back to the Film Alchemist Podcast, the show where we take the movies we love, break them apart, to find out what gives them their magic. I'm your host, Josh Griffey, joined as always by my friend who has the face of a lot of men I've been seeing around lately and co-host. Definitely Alex Dandino. <laughs> Got that face. He has that specific look, as they say in the film. Uh, before we get into this this wonderful new film... A little bit of business. People, it's official. We are on Patreon. That's right. <laughs> Patreon.com slash, slash Film Alchemist Pod. The very best way to support the show. The very best way to make this show exactly what it's you want. Buck. Guys, it's only a buck. You get in for a buck. You see what we're working on. You meet our friends over there. And as you climb the official Highlander tier ranking system, you get votes on the movies that we talk about in a patron exclusive library. You can even pick the very specific movies you want us to talk about for you. We are working on so much cool stuff over there, uh, trying to make sure that it really is a great value for you guys. It means the world to us for those of you who support. Hopefully some of you listening today will find it in your hearts to come on over and join the fun. Again, as little as a dollar a month, and believe us, we appreciate every single person and every single dollar that helps the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Make sure you go to the the email for the show, filmalchemistpod at gmail.com. The YouTube channel, if you want to see our faces, make sure we look different enough to be cool. Uh, that is Film Alchemist. You can find us on all the socials you're on. Something easy you can do uh, and also free to help the show. Make sure you leave a rating and review wherever you find us. It helps us defeat the algorithmic patriarchal system that won't let us break free and be what we wants to be. Uh, so all of these ways, guys, um, are great ways to help us out. We appreciate how much you guys do for us. Thank you. All right. Without further ado, sorry, my voice is a little weak today. Still got these seasonal allergies. Uh, just burning through COVID tests to make sure that it's not sneaky getting COVID. But no, it's just allergy stuff. Uh, so bear with me. Like this movie, it feels like I've got dandelions all up in my throat. And I don't like it but today alex and i are very excited uh something we're going to try to be doing more of moving forward right the kind of nice thing is is hopefully the cases begin to subside and the pandemic begins to wane a little bit uh not that it's gone is that we're starting to get awesome movies regularly back in the theater right it's a wonderful thing so as often as we can manage, we're going to try to get out to the new movies that we're really excited about and get you guys some discussions about new movies. We're more of an archival show where we talk about things that have already happened. Sometimes it's nice to get in and talk about the fresh new stuff. So without uh, belaboring that point, we went to the theater this weekend and saw Alex Garland's new film, Men. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we both absolutely adore Alex Garland and his work. I think it is not a stretch to say this will be his most challenging piece that uh, people have run across yet. <laughs> I I went with my wife to see this movie, right? Wow. Uh, we snuck out and saw like the earliest Friday screening. We both had nothing going on. So like, let's just get out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's essentially us, two other guys, and a really old couple. Like, if you told me they were 80-year-old people, I'd have been like, of course. Right. In listening to them talk out loud at full volume, because I'm assuming the hearing was not good, awesome. expressing their pure exacerbation at what was happening on this screen about how they are just living in a future that does not look like the world they once knew, watching these things unfurl on the screen. Um, but surprisingly seemed like they liked it, man. It was it was a cool experience. I, I It's one of those films that just is dripping with dread constantly. And as often as you might get lost, that is ever present, right? I remember looking over early in the film, right? When Jessica Buckley's being shown the estate, right? And just watching my wife kind of curl up into a ball and just watching her face, you could see the reaction that these things that felt pretty innocuous to me, right? Just a guy showing her the house. She so early in the movie, as she explained to me later, began to feel that this is wrong. This is all wrong. Run. Mm -hmm. Those kind of red flags, and it's just this, this sense of dread that that really is masterfully built and never really lets go that anchors us through this movie. Um, Alex, opening thoughts on Mian. 
It's interesting you bring up this, how you don't clue into this kind of like dread. Cause like you feel it, like, you know, it's there, but there is like this level of this actually happened to me recently. I kind of had to check my male privilege. Uh, I suggested a movie to a female friend. Um, and, uh, uh for the, uh, just quickly, a movie called the movie fresh, which fresh. is on Hulu. I suggested to a female friend and she, I was like, yeah, it's fun. It's kind of cool. It's weird. You know, it's freaky. She's like, okay, I'll check it out. She text messaged me in the middle of the movie. She's like, why the fuck would you say that this movie isn't scary? And I'm like, yeah, it's not. I mean, I didn't think it was that scary. It's just kind of weird. And she's like, this is fucking terrifying. I'm single and I live alone. I'm like, oh, and I looked at Andrea. I was like, hey, am I not supposed to suggest a movie? She's like, you're such a fucking guy. Like, no, you can't suggest those movies aren't scary when it's yeah. like, it's about a woman. I'm like, Oh wow, that is a good point. Like that is like one of those things that was really fascinating. So watching men without Andrea, so I went without her because um, obviously we have the kid. Uh, I just went out that night. And I was like, I'm gonna go see men. I was like, I don't think you should watch that movie until it's available on VOD. And she goes, Yeah, that's probably a good point. I I started explaining to her what was kind of happening in the movie. She's like, Yeah, I'll probably wait for it to be on VOD. But I I will say this. I had that same. I was like, if there's ever a movie, I wish. I could have just got at home day one. Yeah, that that movie, one. I, did, I didn't need to see that movie in a theater, right? No. If I could have bought this at my house, I think I would have watched it like four times in a row. I would have watched just it. Just trying to least, dig into it. I would have watched it at least twice, by, at least yeah. twice by now to keep going into it. But like, all right, all that out of the way. This movie's, it was just one of the, like, I walked out just going, wow. Like I, there's, this is a great example. Like I, Alex Garland is a great filmmaker. Like there's mm-hmm. no doubt about that. Like he has per, an incredible eye, incredible attention to detail. There's this level of fuck you witness to the way that he's made this movie. That's like, listen, I don't give a shit what you think about how I make a movie. I'm making the movie I want to make. You decide how you would like to interpret it. Because I can surmise like at least four different interpretations depending on your subjective viewpoint as to what the ending of this movie means, the overall concept and theme in the movie is. Like there's so many different rationales for how the movie works. And I think that's just fucking brilliant. Like I, I yeah. really I enjoyed watching the movie. Like I obviously agree. I would have loved to see it in my house so I could watch it at least one at least one or two other times. So I'd be like, yeah. hang on, right here. I actually <laughs> texted you as like cause there was this fucking couple in the movie who would not get off their phones. Like one guy at one point had like left. He's like, uh, like literally left the theater with his phone. I was like, finally they understand. It's annoying. This woman just kept pulling up her phone and it was distracting the <laughs> shit out of me. And I missed like a key fucking line at the end of the movie that I texted you about. It was like, that was driving me fucking nuts. Yeah. What he ended up saying. So like, I, again, like there's at least, at this moment, four different ways you could. I think you could interpret how this movie themes itself. I oh, also I, could be wrong. Yeah. Maybe there's not. I, I like, think it's way more, right? Like okay. this. Uh, this movie I'm to me wrong. feels like a like, great like. Unboxing. Four seems very conservative. Four seems very conservative. <laughs> well, no, I I, th- I think that the trick of this movie, right, is that yeah. it feels like a great gift box, right, where you just open it up and you don't know. I don't know why people subscribe to these things, right? Where it's like every month they're like, I get one every month. It's like, do you want like man box or whatever it's called? We'll send you maybe a knife. We'll send you maybe beard cream. We'll send you. And I'm like, why do I want you to just send me random shit in a tiny box? I'll just go buy what I want. Right. But I, I do understand the fun of like, oh, my new thing is here. Right? right. And like, I'll see what weird treats are in it. That's how I think of this movie, right? This, because. One of the things that was kind of racking my mind in the middle of it is it's one of those films where I just it sent my brain into overdrive where I'm trying. So my brain is trying so hard to connect these cables. Right. It took me a long time into the movie to just realize I don't think they connect on purpose. Right. I think I think it's so fun and rare to see a movie that just says. I'm not here to tell you a narrative. I'm not here to tell you. An exact story. I'm right. here to make you feel. It's very rare to sit in a movie. To sit in a movie and literally all it's doing the entire time is going. 
well, what do you think? Like, that's literally yeah. all I was thinking the entire movie is I am being asked to not do the work necessarily, but do the work. But also I'm being asked to like really pay attention and be like, what do you think about this? Yeah. Please tell me in your own way by reacting to the yes. screen. Like I, and a, a lot of movies, the more they try rare. to explain away plots or mysteries, this and that you're, you're inherently your brain starts taking over from, from the gut reactions to the film. Right. right? And this movie never sacrifices that just looming fear and dread and nausea to try to tell us what's happening. And, it was one of the, yeah, the movie ends and we're going home and I'm like on my phone, you know, Googling all these things. I think I've got like little tidbits here and there. I'm like, oh, I'm going to piece this thing together in a, you know, grand, grandiose, like magnum opus that explains it all away. And my wife's just like, what the fuck? We have to talk about that. And like, we just were. And as, because this is the thing, this movie is this, it, it's a jumble, right? I think of it like those, if you ever played bingo, right? They put the balls yep. in that fucking thing and jumble them up. There is, um, obviously these kind of multiple reality points that we touch, right? So there's the life before there's the, the house, the village, the forest, all these places. Right. And everywhere we go, there are just these just symbolisms popping everywhere. Right. And it, it feels like a lot of them don't match, right? Like the idea of putting the great God pan, right? This fertility deity or the green man, whoever he may be. Right. And these kind of, you know, early Wiccan fertility deities, right? Right. Okay, but what does that have to do with the Christian church? And then the fact that Rory Kinnear's characters kind of represent all of these patriarchal institutions and uh, versions of things that help mold these men into toxic traits, right? Right. All right, well, what does that have to do? So all the guys in the movie who she's seeing, right, as if, uh, one man somewhere in the past traumatized her and now she sees this and all these other toxic men's behavior all right well what is that her, but her boyfriend's an african-american guy like why doesn't she see him as that guy you know what i mean not so you're sitting there running through or not african <laughs> british i don't know what the phrase for that i just yeah I always, he's a black man he's a black man in, in the uk right <laughs> not american at all but uh not even close yeah, that see, that's my United States lens. But uh, the other side of the pond. <laughs> so I was just like, but that like really bothered me. I was like, why is her her boyfriend this black man, mm -hmm. and he's the one who is caused this source of grief? Where it's the genesis of the movie. Why then make that decision if you're Alex Garland to go to the village, and everyone she sees is Rory Kinnear? I was like, did he literally just say? I want every man to look like the most fucking milk toast square motherfucker. So he becomes this catch-all for all these different types of men. Walk me through this, because this is kind of the gimmick in the trailer and the thing that people latch on to, which I don't think is as wildly important to the film as it was portrayed. Why is Rory Kinnear the face of all the men in this village and he's not the face of her boyfriend, let alone the same race as her boyfriend? I mean, to me, it's a matter of... I mean, for me, it's a matter of interpretation, I guess. But I would say the reason being that all men look the same. To all men look the same. They are all of the same threatening ilk in this village. The reason they don't look like her husband is because her husband is unique in the way that he Ooh, loved I like her. That. And, and the way that he loved her and the way that he she felt about him. Because she's still, she's still grieving. So I think that there's there's a uniqueness to how she felt about uh, James, right? Is that the it's think, not the actor's name, but the yeah. character's name is James, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The uniqueness yeah. to how she felt about James, how she feels about other men now, particularly after what happened, is probably that they are homogenized into one sort of overall look. Now, granted, there's the key difference is that Jeffrey looks demonstrably different than the rest of them, which is one of the Rory Kinnear clones. I don't know why. I'm assuming it's just a. I'm assuming we'll get to I, that. I, honest, the, the honest, thing was to me, and I, I was talking to my buddy, and I was like, it really kind of bothered me this difference, right? Like, you know, why would you whitewash the trauma? You know, pun intended. Sure, sure. I guess I, I like the idea that because he's so specifically, this is the thing. Her husband in this movie is a real piece of shit. 
right? Like he really, in the moment of her saying, I can't live like this, I need to go. We can author as an audience, right? That there has been trauma and some stuff going on before. The cruelty with which he attacks her, knowing her her softer spots of her heart and goes at, you know, I'll kill myself. This is on you. And just violently lashing out at her, right? Not asking right. why. Not asking what can I no, do to change. Not doing, not doing what a reasonable person would do, but right. instead having such a visceral emotional reaction to I want a divorce. Which, look, I'm not saying, look, luckily... Andrea has not asked me to not live with her anymore. So I'm not in that situation. But like that visceral moment where your partner is asking you something like an unthinkable, an unthinkable think for you personally, that is an emotion completely wrapped in illogical, irrational emotion. So it's hard, I think, when you're not experiencing it to look at it from a way that like, why would you not just ask her, what can I do? Like, how do I do it? And he tries to get at that in that first scene where they're like sitting on the bed and he's like, they're trying to explain, but also again, he's not listening to her. Like there's this whole thing. Never for a second. Listen, not even anything she says. Yeah. She's not, he's not listening to her. Like, I think that's the thing that was most interesting to me about moving it forward into the movie was, when you see these scenes of them together the day the day that it happens, you realize, like, yeah, like, clearly some other shit went down. We're not privy to it. But it doesn't matter because the, like, microcosm of the experience we've had with James and uh, Jesse Buckley's character, Harper, are, th- th- like, it doesn't matter. Like, he's not listening to her. All he's doing is whatever whatever feelings she's having, he is receiving and then pushing right back onto her by saying stuff like i will kill myself if you leave me like oh yeah doing these kinds of like trying to guilt rid her essentially so that like guilting someone into staying with you which i think we all can agree is not the healthiest thing to do but no 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 ultimately it's just this really it's just this really visceral emotion and i think that is what makes him so different from that's what makes him separate and different from anybody because we see no other men obviously besides Roy Kinnear and uh the husband through the entire movie like absolutely yeah. no other men and only one other woman it's a very yeah. small cast yeah so, I, I think I think what it is right know. is because he never receives anything she says there's no moment of rationality right with the moments we see in the apartment are these bright red drenched colors right Mm -hmm. high passion blood guts right you know the the stuff of you know the deep down getting into it right and i think the first thing we see is just her screaming with a bloody nose and so we can assume that something not good has happened right so the movie as it walks through right because to me everything is the baseline for everything in the movie is this day obviously she rationally, probably after something horrible, is like, you know, I'm out of here. He immediately, without anything, I'll kill myself. So he immediately goes to manipulation. And what I think they're doing is they're using him as this guidepost for all of these really terrible, toxically masculine traits, right? The, sure. the, the running theme of the movie, to me, seems to be at times that as a woman takes control of herself, However, that is right. I want to be autonomous. I don't want to be attached to you. I don't want to be a partner. Right. I want to be out on my own. I want to do whatever the fuck I want whenever I want. Watching men not be able to cope with that, right? I, I think oh, there totally. there is this thing. We talked about it in Rosemary's Baby too, right? This fear of the power of women, right? That you know, by nature, they have this power of giving life and sustaining life, and how that fucking terrifies us. You know, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Not us men, you know, as a whole. Hopefully not me and you. No, I'm an adult. That doesn't terrify <laughs> yeah. me, but yes, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> but yeah, so in a broader sense, right? And so what he does is, in, it's not that he's sad that he's losing Harper. It's the, the idea of people knowing that he has lost this manliness somewhere. Sure. So he reacts with violence. And then he physically hits her when he thinks that she is talking to a friend, right? So that now he has been physically unmasked well, is not man he, enough 
at, outed as some sort of unstable person. And by the way, but I think it's the, more about the masculine attack than the psychological. Sure, and but and that's this is the other thing too, and the verification that that's so. It's not just Harper's. I mean, I guess you could say there's a subjective notion of what Harper's seeing or feeling from other people. But, I mean, this happens with everybody in the movie. Every other iteration of Rory Kinnear in the movie doesn't really listen to her. Like, the cop, the uh, – Je Jeffrey's the only one who seems to – we can get more to Jeffrey. But, like, everybody else seems to – I mean, the most glaring reference to this is the vicar who literally – blames yeah. her for stuff like we will break down does Rory not listen Kinnear's to anything guys, she yeah. says but like more <laughs> yeah. importantly for sure no one no man is actually listening to her throughout the movie they're all receiving her information and reinterpreting it as like well this is how i feel about that it's not like how do you feel about that like it's so much it's so much just regurgitation of the same talking points that you might do when you don't feel like you have anything i look in my marriage, I am wrong, I don't know, 99% of the time. I have to apologize a lot. But, like, that is exactly what that is. So I think there is this level of – there is this level of blame you try to shift to your partner in any sort of relationship that happens in this movie theoretically a lot. And Jesse Buckley spends the entire movie just sitting there going – like, shrugging me like, why are any of you being like this? There's no rational explanation for any of this. Like the concept of dealing with a rationality, particularly in maybe like super fragile egoed men runs the gamut through this whole fucking movie. It's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And I, I think getting to Rory Kinnear's part, right? Sure. Cause one of the things I keep hearing people kind of mention online, right? Is that, this is some kind of dream state, right? That because no. of the the surreal nature of all of them having the, like when they do the like his face on the little kid face, sure, it looks really bad. Like it's jarring to yeah. the eye. Oh, absolutely. And again, I don't. I thought that was on purpose. Of course, yeah, obviously it's on purpose for sure. But I think some people use that as like, oh, it's not real. To me, the way I take a lot of this, right, because. My argument that it all happens, right, in some form or another. There are clearly things at the house at the end of that movie that are not happening in the physical reality as we're shown. I think you can look at it and say 90-some percent of what we see happens in some form, right? Sure. Um, the fact of the scene with the female cop and this and that, there are, there are touchstones of reality that don't fit. To me, I saw she's just gone through this horrifying trauma, right? with this guy who abused her and then killed himself and tried to put that on her, right? Mm -hmm. You will carry this forever. This will haunt you. Inflicting, again, his frailties on her and trying to infect her with that same kind of thought process. Right. The, the, but even, like, so the first time we go and out into this country house, right, the first thing we see, obviously, is this moment of great peace and relief as she drives to the countryside. After we know something bad happens, she grabs an apple and takes a bite, right? We get him an Adam and Eve joke, right? right? One of the first, you know, Eve was created from Adam essentially just to be his entertainment, I guess. And then she blows it all. It's this really, you know, obviously yeah. male lens story. Super right? male point of view. <laughs> and so that feels like we're set in because Jeffrey's immediately taken back by the, oh, you had the gumption to just take an apple by yourself? Oh, I thought you uh, were a missus, you know, not not a miss. Mm -hmm. uh, there are these moments of he's like, because this is the thing to me. Jeffrey represents landowners, the vicar, the church, right? The police, the state. Um, the more interesting one is the little kid who kind of, you know, feels like he's this. I got to be this to toxically masculine guy. But, you know, maybe that's not his true self, as we see from the, uh, you know, kind of 50s doll mask that he's wearing. Um, so the idea that everywhere she goes, she's butting up against this one type of guy, right? So in my mind, I was wondering, is Rory Kinnear's face just to look like this generic middle of the road guy, or is there a chance that this is someone who traumatized her previously? And so now whenever something like that happens, that's who she sees. Is his face the first teacher that was inappropriate with her? Was he... Some guy who followed her home one day and scared the hell out of her. 
Um, what do you make of that? How, what do you? Why do you think he chose that kind of a look? Garland or Garland? Because yeah. clearly these people do not all look the same in the town, right? No, they look. Why is she seeing similar. that face? I mean, I think that it's. I don't know if you can really say that it was somebody from her past, or something like that, because there's no evidence of that. And like, if that, I mean, to be honest with you, if that's what it is, and that's in the movie, I think that's kind of shitty storytelling. Would <laughs> not explain that to us at all. Um, this movie is not about explaining. Yeah, but like that, what you're talking about is a story point that would need to be addressed. And if it's not, that's like leaving a huge piece. I on think the, the movie floor. is telling us that the trauma that these kind of old male mindset. And honestly, we're seeing it right now in our very world. These old world sure. mindsets do a lot of damage. I don't disagree. I think what you're pointing at, what you're get, what we're trying to do. And like what you're getting at is giving a rationale for why everyone looks like Rory Kinnear uh, that like works thematically within the story. And I don't like, I'm not seeing that anywhere in the movie itself. Like what I would say <laughs> is that, and I don't think it's a bad dude. I don't think it's a bad notion. There's absolutely nothing about it that makes sense to me at all. Like, I think the concept of all of them looking like Rory Kinnear in the town specifically is more or less just a commentary on how, like I said before, all men look dangerous to a woman who's alone in a town surrounded by people. Like, it doesn't matter who you are. I don't care. Like, that's just I have had to learn that just because that's part of life. And that was like the story I was telling you at the top. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter. Everyone feels that but they're every, not every... all dangerous though. Like the child is not a danger to her immediately. The vicar is not yeah, a but... danger to her immediately. I mean, I think the danger in that regard, I'm not saying danger is in like mortal danger. And danger in that regard it functions on multiple levels. But I think right. the reason Jeffrey looks different than the rest of them is Jeffrey is the embodiment. He's of got a little intent. more toothiness, Jeffrey. A little more toothiness, a <laughs> little more hair. The nose is kind of bulbous. Like he has more, his face is not an exact copy like the rest of them are. Do even you the think green, he's, even the green man has an exact copy face originally. Is he the guy? If you had to peg, do you think Jeffrey is as we see him in the film? What do you mean? So here's the thing, right? My, one of the things I was thinking watching the movie, right? Because obviously there there can easily be Oh, are you saying, idea. like, do I think that's what Jeffrey looks like for sure? Is like, that the real Jeffrey? And she says he has that specific look, right, as someone who could be a problem. So that sure. manifest on the faces of all these other guys. Because, again, obviously the I'm big stuff sure like I, the church, the state, the young I repressed think, boy, all that. Right. I mean, like, I don't – like, I think he it's looks It's such a weird enough. thing to put in the movie if it doesn't have this – this I think he looks idea. different enough. I think he looks different enough from the other Rory Kinnears where I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's how that would go. I understand what you're saying. Like, and I get it. Like it should track that way. And again, I, because the trailers led me to believe like maybe there was one actual Rory Kinnear and the rest of them had like very different looks because. Well, ri okay. So riddle me this, right? Cause this is a big point of the movie. This is kind of the entire gimmick they're selling us. Right. Do you think who did she kill at the end of the movie? Right. Was it a vagrant that she found walking in the woods or Jeffrey? You talking about in the post credits thing? Yeah. When they come back to reality or, you know, the day after not reality, the day after right. she's sitting there in blood. There's blood on the doorstep. Her friend gets out pregnant um, and sees this and takes this scene in kind of wide eyed like, oh, shit. Um, weirdly, Amy's like, oh, she was in on it. And I was like, what? And I was like, it's one of those movies that has you jumping at shadows. I was like, the pregnant friend was in on it. What are you talking about? Um, <laughs> but uh, what did you make of who? I mean, she obviously hurt someone in my mind, right? I guess you could look at it as maybe I'll she cut this. herself. I'll, I'll take this one it's step a lot of blood. further. I actually don't think she killed anyone. She killed something or cut herself. Is that what you're going with? Uh, if she killed something, because obviously, yeah, she's covered in blood. If she killed something and what we're not doing is assigning this, it was all a dream shit to the narrative. Cause mm -hmm. I think that's absolute nonsense. 
Clearly, there was not a rolling berth in the house, but yeah. Look, I'm not saying that <laughs> we'll yeah, get I'm to not that. Saying that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that the last ten minutes of this movie yeah. aren't prolifically weird to the point where like this can't be real. But yeah, I mean, to me, it ends up being. <sighs> I don't know who she killed, but I know that they bur- she buried them. More specifically, oh shit! See, I I don't know because if that, I to me. To me, the metaphor is about. To okay. me, the metaphor is about being finished with the past. In that regard, like what she's not going to do is carry this guilt with her. Mm-hmm. So it's de- like then it is like on the nose, dead and buried. There's a lot of on the nose shit in this movie that is on the nose. Yet I'm not sure intentionally on the well, nose. When when one face has so many noses, you can do that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, one face has two noses. It's yeah. Jeffrey and Rory. I don't know why Jeffrey looks different than the rest of them. It's driving me nuts. He's the Magnum. <sighs> Jeffrey. I just don't. It's, it, here's the thing. If you if you don't accept that she killed someone at the end, right, then are, is your contention that there was actually no blood on that door? No, I think there's blood. Like I don't I don't think the blood Where'd is. Where did the blood come from, dude? Oh, no, no. I didn't say. I, I'm, I didn't say that. I'm backtracking. What I was trying to say was she didn't sure. kill any. I don't think this she is killed. the perfect episode for backtracks. We are trying to sort this out in real like, time. What she didn't do was like what I don't think she did was like she didn't kill James or anything like that. Like that. We'll get we can get we can get further into that. But like to me, whoever she might have killed. And I look, I cannot surmise who it is. There's like four different people you could make a guess at. But like couldn't tell you my my theory because that's dragged that's dragged through the through the house sure. blood. My my theory of what's really happening is that she actually does stumble upon this this living rough vagrant type, right? Sure. She follows her. You know, he kind of stalks her at the house, right? Things get creepy. Mm-hmm. I think you look at the point when they arrest him and she has her conversation with the female cop, which is a great scene. Because it's the first time she kind of relents and has someone to actually talk to in the flesh that is hearing what she's saying. And she's kind of saying, you know, this and that. And the the female cop reads it and just goes, I get it. Like, I understand why this is, you know, bad and scary. Right. Hopefully it's not going to get worse and he's not bad, whatever. So she's kind of doing the line of like the state, right? Sure. But she has that core level empathy with what Harper is experiencing. So to me, that vagrant does exist and is someone that is fucking coming after her again. The thought that then at the end of the movie, this this vagrant guy comes back for her, right? When the police let him go. And on top of that, in her trauma, her PTSD surfaces, and she sees him as every other man who has scared her in this town, right? Jeffrey, the cop, uh, the guy who looks like fucking Sugar Ray in the back by the dartboard. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, the little boy. I mm-hmm. think the idea that she puts this notion upon him, um, you know, and is fighting to save her life and just kind of reliving this trauma. Like you said, that at the very core, the nature of how society is set up, the fact that so many men are foisted into this mindset of, You know, you got to fucking destroy things. You go get what you want. You take like, how can you give all those football speeches as a dad and not expect this to be the outcome? Right. Like one of the most telling lines is when Jeffrey goes out to check the grounds. Mm -hmm. Right. And he goes, my father always said I had the the makings of a failed military man. So even Jeffrey has this. He he realizes he's not manly enough. Right. The vicar has this weird sexual repression. So does the young child. You know, there there are but these think, moments. But I think in the way that while Jeffrey is creepy, mm-hmm. this is why I think Jeffrey looks different than the rest of them. Why he's not a carbon copy, so to speak, is that Jeffrey is representing this version of man that is. It's the attempt at being empathetic. It's the attempt of not being. Yeah. I agree not, with that. It's trying to not be what you expect a groundskeeper to be, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But that is and that's why. The little kid is so much more threatening because that is the version of like, oh, we've passed this horrendous like it's what you and I talk about when we're raising boys, like trying to not raise children who are assholes 
Yeah. Because we don't want them to be anything like some of the people that we knew. We're like, you oh, gotta dude. be better than Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, kids. right? So we had this thing in the yard where Hunter's doing this, you know, oh, he fights like a girl, like one of those old jokes from our childhood. Right. And Amy was like, What the fuck? And like pulled him aside and I was like, Hey man, you know two of the kids you're playing with in the yard are girls, right? Are they your friends? He goes, Yeah. And I go, how do you make how do you think it makes them feel when you say that the people who are bad at the game play like girls? And he goes, Well, I don't know. And I was like, Well, that seems like a pretty shitty thing to do. Would you be happy if your friends made fun of you like that? He's like, No. And I was like, it's so baked in the cake, right? Movies yeah. we love. Like when I was a kid, everyone used to do the sand like he plays ball like a girl. It was so prevalent in how I was raised. Is that, you know, girls were pink and weak and delicate. And we were tough and fighters. We had to protect everyone and do that. And I was like, it's just so, and I think that's part of the, you know, the many faces of, you know, one guy, one kind of guy. Sure. Is it's, it's so just fucking built into how we, we talk about men and kids. And, and I feel like hopefully now it's getting, you do see this violent backlash, right? So like beta cuck simp, whatever the fuck these like catch words are of these like angry, you know, avatars on Twitter. But I'm hoping now that we're getting to this point, and I think what this movie's tapping into is that all of these men have this this fatal flaw, right? And maybe that Jeffrey really did go out in that garden to try to be a good guy. And because of that, you know, I have to do this thing to, you know, fight the ghost of my father, which I, a lot of men I know were all still dealing with this trauma of, like, not being the men our fathers wanted us to be. Sure. Um, maybe gets got, man. You know, maybe he gets, you know, taken down or killed. And then that's when the, the assault moves into the house. Right. Right. And so well, I, I think at a base level, there there is this fucking horrifying attack. And then the mind, you know, when she's sitting out there on that step, it seems like she's running back through the horrifying events of the evening. Right. And this is somewhat what we're seeing. But I do think an attack happened. I do. Can I ask you something though that like yeah. was actually bothering me just on like basic storytelling in a horror movie perspective, which is like after here's my thing. After she goes to the she goes to the pub and mm-hmm. the cop who looks like Rory Kinnear says that they had to let the naked vagrant guy go. Mm-hmm. She is visibly scared and she's very uncomfortable. She yeah. runs back to the house. It's like it's very creepy, very foreboding. Again, beautifully naked shot naked dude in the naked. background yeah naked dude in the terrible. background this is what i don't understand and this is the thing i was trying to figure out why it e- why it would even why it wouldn't even come up why does she spend so much time not getting in her fucking car to drive home now and i don't i was like is that significant or yeah, is that it, just it's, do it's, we need absolutely significant okay because i was like is this just like you know it's, one it's, kid gets yeah. one kid gets stabbed at camp crystal lake why don't they all just run away Th- this is so much different to me right okay because right she specifically says right her friends like i want to come out and you know i don't think this is the classic horror movie like turn the light on why do you go into no, a room no, no, no 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 not at all but she, the, she tells her friend right and her friend's like let me come up there Right. You know, this is fucked up. I'll be there with you. We'll do it. And she goes, this is about me not being afraid. This is about me reclaiming my my presence, my being, my, right. you know, my agency. So I think sure. specifically for her to get in that car and run is putting her in the world where I'll be doing this forever. I'll always be running from James or that fucking that guy or all the totally. other guys that look like him. So mm-hmm. I think a part of her is I'm going to stay here and, you know, hope that these guys do the right thing. And if they don't, I will fight to defend myself. Right. Um, and clearly, you know, the worst case scenario happens. But I don't think that is. But see, that's what I think happens. Right. So for you, it's get in the car. For me, it's why is the boyfriend, you know, a black guy and all these guys are white guys. Also, the basic thing of these two events feeling like they don't really connect a lot i feel like by the end of the movie they did a good job of just sure this this male you know right fountain of trauma gets all over the place there's another aspect of harper's personality that i 
didn't understand, but I think we might have covered it already. But it's when she tells Jeffrey at the beginning of the movie she doesn't play piano. And then in the middle of the movie, she sits down and yeah. plays piano. You know By the why? way, this... my theory at least. Sure. She's done performing, man. That is exactly she what I She doesn't want to do say. the fucking show. If she says yes, he's going to be like, play. Right. Or it's like, it, to me, I was like, oh, this is like intimate knowledge that she doesn't need anyone else to know. Like, she doesn't want anyone. Like, she plays piano for herself. That's what she does. It's not for anyone else's entertainment. Yeah. It's for her to release. I. Yeah, I, I mean, that part, again, like, there's little stuff like that in this movie that is uh, that is so fascinating mm-hmm. to me. There's another part, and this is more in regards to, like, your and I's preference for me. This movie goes fucking fast, dude. Yeah. It is a hundred-minute movie. Like, I was shocked when I got out of the theater. It felt like 50 minutes. Like, when we started getting to the end, I'm like, oh, this shit's wrapping up. I was like, up. holy shit, this is the end of the movie? <laughs> yeah. I was expecting, no. like, we're not going to be here another night? My God. Because this movie doesn't give you those times where you're, like, disconnected. And you're like, hmm, I wonder if no, anyone no, 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 texts no. me. Like, they're doing, you know, this bit. You're mm-hmm. really emotionally in. Um, one of the things I loved, Alex, uh, is the walk in the woods, right? The first walk in the woods. Yep. Again, this is where we start getting these kind of mashing, you know, biblical allegory with, uh, you know, early pagan shit, right? Right. I love the scene when she's singing to herself in mm. the the old railway tunnel. I think it's fucking beautiful, right? This She's lyricizing with herself. And again, just the visual of she's having this great moment of relief. She's smiling at the simplest things, trees, nature, just right. being out in the world. The moment she experiences joy, this fucking guy stands up and starts coming for her. She tries to run, but there he is, right? Everywhere she turns. The house up there, she's running around. There was a moment in there I thought was interesting. When she runs past the walkway, right? She comes to another train tunnel. This one is completely boarded up and blocked off. Mm -hmm. She has to run up and around by that empty house where she gets the dick pic from a distance, right? Right. What did you make of that tunnel? That felt like an important visual to me. Like that it's locked up? Yeah, that maybe it's, you know, this thought of she can't just openly be exposed anymore in the world. That there are I thought about that too because it I thought about that too because it comes back around again. Yeah. Um, and like a very different scene too. Like she runs into the door to try to open it. Like to me, going back into the tunnel, this other tunnel is her like that's what she's trying to do like that's her actually her trying to go back in the tunnel is literally like the version of her getting into the car to drive back to london mm-hmm. like she's she's locking herself out to say like you need to stay like you're staying like you need to do this for yourself like there's a lot of that level of empowerment i think I don't know. I mean, like that would be my only. Yeah. That would be one of the ways I'd interpret it. You could there's, also there's say there's definitely that like it's... a real birth canal imagery in this movie. Sure, right. That you... her having a moment of joy there's breeds definitely this. birth canal image imagery in this movie. Well, that yes. that guy just getting up in there and then running out. Right, the the dandelion entering her mouth. Right, there's a lot of these kind of penetrative moments like that. So that you one being it. blocked, it felt like either she could never run mm-hmm. from these, like you know creatures that are coming after her or she has to hide the things that make her feminine because that's what's drawing this monster to her sure i mean again i think it's just a matter of it's locking away things that she's it's it's like her trying to get out of addressing these things by maybe yes going back to london or not talking about these things like or playing the piano for jeffrey these like kinds of things that you i think in other movies of less subjective ilk you would see a scene where she plays piano for jeffrey or like this would be a movie about these guys literally did you not expect the camera to pan and jeffrey to be there like furious when at the when she's playing piano did you not expect the whip around and jeffrey's like "Hmm, really Hmm, ha I expected him. I was so you know, fucking scared when she was playing that piano, to be honest. You know what was weird? I actually was expecting, like, because that happened. Sorry, my memory is a little shot. Is That is, like, that's the scene where she, the naked guy, though, shows up, right? And she. she no, that's when cops. she does the, uh, you know, tour for her friend. She's showing him this lovely right, house. Right, right, right. 
Right, and but that's when the they background. see he's in the background. Yeah, okay. That was where I was expecting, again, I was expecting Jeffrey to show up yeah. to like, oh, there's a naked guy at this house, or yeah. to like, I heard, uh, I heard the tinkling of the ivers. But, well, that, that's what you? I mean, though. The, the movie oh, yeah. does a great job because it feels like this innocent moment of like, hey, man, I don't do that. Just because it's the same thing we all do in conversation when someone like is trying to argue or whatever, and you go, hmm, wow. Yeah. Just because you like, I don't want to do this with you. Mm-hmm. And the movie sets it up so much where you see anything like that. Anytime you're like, this is going to lead to violence and terrible things. It's a really wonderful through line that's in the movie totally. where such little things like that you as an audience member especially for me as a male audience member feel the fear of that reciprocity very much so that i think is important for us to fucking feel and be afraid yeah. of um just you know what another thing though connecting to these scenes right one of the things i thought was brilliant as we move into this body horror segment the mm-hmm. soundtrack of this body horror assault is her yeah. echoing song from the tunnel Mm-hmm. Again, kind of reiterating that had you not enjoyed yourself and sang in that fucking tunnel, this man wouldn't attract you down and none of this would be happening. I thought that was a fucking brilliant choice. Like, it really like chilled me to the bone when you yeah. heard the ha, ha, ha. I think the thing that is most impressive about the movie is, and I'll be honest, like maybe it's just an inkling of how women feel in general. But, like, the fear and dread that are so prevalent throughout the entire film's vibe is so intense. And when it gets to the stuff that is a little more theatrical, especially in the third act when we're about to hit this huge, like, body horror segment, the real-life stuff almost feels less dangerous than, like, her these, like, visions she's having. I don't know. It's a really, It's a really fascinating horrifying thing when you're watching you're just like wow like i've never experienced the amount of i've experienced some dread in theaters before but the amount of dread of just like like when she locks herself in the bathroom and the vicar lets himself in okay before we get to body horror that scene is fucking horrifying you know a scene i thought was really fucking scary i wanted to hone in on with with you was the bar scene right Sure. When she walks into the bar, because I think this is one of the things the movie does really well. Is it's so fucking subtle, mm-hmm. but it is this fucking Hitchcockian like explosion waiting to happen thing. Right. What did you make of when she goes in there? It's real quiet. There again, like I said, Sugar Ray's in the corner. Sugar yeah. Ray, Rory, just like fucking glaring. Sugar Ray and what about that you know, scene? Half works Christ for you? Navarro's <laughs> in the corner for sure. Hey, you want to be on Tattoo Masters? No, let's go to the bar. And be creeps. Okay, cool. Uh, what did, what about that scene was really working for you? I, I really thought that was a brilliant kind of hinge point into this big third act body horror stuff. You know what's weird? The thing that was working for me was, again, it is the, it's Jeffrey sitting in there being so Saying like, scrumping. <laughs> so like haphazard. Like there's just like, he's just, oh, like something, something wrong with your rental. What was what, 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 wrong? Like it's so like this. It's so like the owl from fucking Sword in the Stone, Archimedes. <laughs> like who? What? What? Like it's this very like. That's what starts working for me so well because we just got done with this super intense scene with the vicar yeah. at the church, which I think Dude, is like that motherfucker. That fucking scene, by the way, is the only scene in it that, and there's a scene in the movie that like just that actually was my favorite scene in the whole fucking movie. Yeah. Uh, but the bar particularly is so fascinating because there's only two people that are really having a conversation in the bar, and that's the cop version of Rory Kinnear and Jeffrey. Jesse Buckley is, again, just, like, sitting there. Like, I think this is the first time we've seen her around more than one character in the movie yeah. since – No, ever. Since the vicar and the kid when he's, like, Since the off, vicar and the first... kid really quickly – but, like, this is the first time we've seen her do prolonged interaction with multiple characters. And, again, like, we're in this situation. And, again, I don't know if maybe my head was just in that space. But I'm just, like, these dudes are just talking over this woman and not paying attention to the fact that, like, 
there's a fucking naked guy out there that's terrifying. Oh, yeah. They don't give a shit. Like, even when she the leaves, most, they like, just go, oh, all right. She's annoying. Like, it's like this really weird, peculiar thing. But, okay, I got to talk about this Vicar scene. But because- before we do that, though, the, the thing in the bar I thought was cool is it has this real, like, invasion of the body snatchers vibe, right? Because I think the fact that there were so many in one place was a really important addition to the film. Sure. It has this stranger in a strange land thing, right? Like you're on an alien planet and you're just looking around like, holy fuck, I can't talk to these things. I can't trust these right. fucking things. And I thought the terror of that leading to her actually sprinting back home. I don't know if I ever told you this. There's this fucking horrifying experience I had in Hollywood. You used to go to that bar with me, the woods, right? Yep. I remember me and my buddy went, my roommate, and we were getting drunk. We're walking home as you do in Hollywood. And I don't remember what the exact setup was, right? But we're walking home. We're smoking cigs. And my buddy's like, hey, look. And I don't know if it was a girl he thought he knew or just a girl he thought was cute that would, like, want to go get another drink. And he shouted out her. He was like, hey. And I will never forget this till the day I die. That girl, without looking back, in, like, fucking dress shoes and a dress, took off fucking sprinting from us. Jesus. And, like, my friend was like, what the fuck? And I remember just being, like, slack-jawed stunned. And I was like, holy fuck, for that moment, she didn't even look around. She just heard my friend and our footsteps. Right. And we could have been the xenomorph, right? And that that really fucking haunted me. That that poor girl, that was just, like, in her mind. And so sure. this scene to me was a really fucking personal, important scene to me. Because I was like, holy shit, man, was that what she was experiencing, right? Just all of us totally. kind of guys in a bar just, like, rolling around like these predators. I mean, and she takes off running. She just feels the eyes on her. Right. I, I don't know if you've ever seen something like that. But when that happened in the movie, like, it, it took me right back to that moment. Just chilled my very soul. Sure. Absolutely. Because it, it's one I of those mean, times where, like, I'm not a monster. But, like, how the fuck does anyone else know that? How does anybody else know? Yeah. Of course. It's I, I thought that scene was very subtle, but fucking chilling. Now, the true vicar scene is fucking awesome. That whole segment at the church in the middle of the movie is fucking. It's incredible. It's, it's grandiose also, is almost how I describe it. It's yeah. also the scene. So like there is this like very metaphorical beat at the very at the very beginning of the scene when she enters the church. The conversation they have, though, is so fascinating and revealing to the plot of the movie because it's the only time. It's a, again, I I love that this is the game Alex Garland's playing throughout the movie, which is like, make up your own fucking mind. We're about to move on to this. To the, we're about to move on to this pub scene. So if you haven't made up your mind yet, I don't know what to tell you. But she sits down with him and they have this very in-depth conversation. It's the first time, though, that she's revealed this detail about uh, James jumping off the top of the apartment and killing himself which is that there's a chance that he went to the flat above theirs to try to climb back down because she locked him out after he, after she uh, after he hit her and maybe lost footing. And this is something crazy, too, because like that first scene in the movie is the slow motion shot of him falling. And the look on his face was like, that seems so jarring. Like, I guess you're yeah. just terrified of, like, this is the end, you know? Yeah. Well, it's one thing but, to like think about it and threaten, but that moment when right, you're like that, and that was like my yeah. assumption throughout the first forty minutes of the movie is like, oh, like he's just like, oh, I've made a terrible mistake. She though like sort of reveals that they think maybe instead of him, he was trying to trying to get back into the apartment. They think maybe he slipped and fell. So I thought about that and like really quickly in the movie. I was like, holy shit, that look on the top the top of the movie on his face is like abject terror of like i did not mean to do this like in this manner i wasn't trying to kill myself it's just scary oh my god i'm gonna die and then the vicar fucking lands this line where it's like well i'm sure feeling you feel i'm sure the guilt you feel is unbelievable and all of us in the theater like all of us in the theater like i the two yeah. dudes in front of me were like like scoffed i was like what the like I like started laughing. I was like, "That guy did not just fucking say that." Yeah, that's an insane thing to say to someone who's grieving over a loved one. Yeah, whatever the re- result of the whatever the result, whatever the reason, it's 
this fascinating thing though that Alex Garland's doing with the script, which is like forcing you to the point of like clearly this guy's a dickhead. But do you agree with him? Like that is like the craziest thing is like I think he is he's, begging you to agree with he's him. He's daring someone to say out loud daring you. That daring they agree it. with that. Because Absolutely. The the two points on that, right? One, it's extra just twisting the knife in your Super guts gnarly, moment man. is totally. because he's the first that white guy yeah <laughs> who steps up and stops this little piece of shit from cussing at her yeah. and being a dick he steps in and he goes would you like to talk right seemingly like he's gonna help so she unfurls this story about he fucking you know punched her in the face and she locked him out mm-hmm. seems fucking reasonable to me and she tells him this detail, right? And this is an important moment in the movie because she says, it all happened so fast. I couldn't possibly, we couldn't have seen each other, right? Sure, of course. So that opening where she sees the scared face probably didn't happen. What I love about that is it's another way that someone, a coroner, a detective, the people upstairs, someone has told her somewhere down the line where mm-hmm. she's overheard that if you unlock the door, he wouldn't have accidentally slipped to his death. Totally. Right? Because the thing, the fact of the matter is, is that this motherfucker, James, chose to fall to his death that day. 100%. By all of his courses of action. And we should not feel bad for him. Um, Maybe that he died. Maybe he could have got his life together or whatever. Like, whatever. This is a short movie. Fuck that guy. Um, yeah. We do not have time. He made his choice. By showing us that opening scene and her asking the victor or vicar, we're letting the audience know she has begin begun to feel that did she do it? Yeah, right. Even though clearly she fucking didn't. Clearly she did not lock eyes with them like that. Most likely, but right. because all these other fucking people, like if you just let the door in and you tried counseling, whatever, this insidious little fucking thing is weaseled in there. And for the vicar to be the guy who seems like he is listening, I'll tell you, I knew something was off when he put his hand on her knee. Yeah. It was like real, oh my God, and that shot at the end when he's like rubbing the fucking bench where her seat was. And his like finger drips down like, ugh. Okay, so we're kind of here now. Wait, there's one other thing he says though. I forgot, there is one other thing he says though that, again, it like, absolutely no one in the audience should be even thinking like, do I agree? Because the answer is no, you don't. Because when he's like, well, you know, women do, you know, sometimes a man has to strike his woman. Oh my God. Who the fuck would no. ever say that? The fucking, but this is what I mean though. Those and that attitudes. Just like, gets, like, fuck off. You don't have to go back a hundred years to find that attitude. Go probably back existed. fucking, 10 yeah. days somewhere. Well, sadly, like, I mean, even today, there are a lot of people. I mean, I've seen, I saw my mom get hit when I was a kid. Like, you know, this shit is everywhere. And the absolutely. excuse making is constant, right? Like, well, you can't divorce for the kids or you took an oath. Um, Before we get to the final, I know we keep pushing it off. There's so many little symbolisms I want to talk about. The opening in the church, right, of her wailing to this classical music. Mm-hmm. The vicar sees it and doesn't approach right away. This is where we go to the, it looks like the um, holy water basin, right? Yeah. That has the the great God pan, the green man, whatever, fertility mm-hmm. deity you want to say, right? A pagan idol in the middle of this church. The other side is a, a engorged, breasted, and stomach of a woman. And they do this, like, spinning, almost toxicity video thing between yeah. the two images, right? With this bright light fucking shot up at them, almost making them look as if they're the mixture of these two are demonic, right? The the right. fertility of a woman and her body harbor, uh, being a harbinger for this evil. I don't know what that fucking means to you. I just thought it was a great image, right? It kind of, And also it's this juxtaposition again of nature versus the pillars of our society, right? That yeah. even in this church and the, you know, all the shit. It's weird. Nature like, creeps in. I thought that would have so much more meaning and symbolism to it. But I think the rest of the movie is so bizarre. I, or at least I thought there would be like, and granted it does kind of pay off at the end. Like it, it or it kind of doesn't depending on how you look at it. But I like, see, I think it pays off huge, but I mean, it pay. 
I don't I don't even know. Like again, yeah. I don't even know. Like I mean, I've so spent hard. the entire weekend saying that exact same thing about this movie. Like, I don't fucking know. I don't know. I'm gonna take a swing at it. I'm just gonna <laughs> start taking wild yeah. swings and say like we're gonna come up and take daddy hacks and fucking work. Our way all these through. whites and Cotston are terrible people. That's yeah. what I, mean. I mean, honestly, it seems like everyone is a fucking pretty bad person that Harper has met <laughs> in this movie. Um all right, so she runs to the house, right? The estate she's rented. Yeah. She gets in. The door starts banging. Right? Noise everywhere. She's trying to call her friend. Okay, one more thing. What did you make of every time the internet reception went out, we saw, like, the jarred VHS face of Joffrey? I mean, to me, that's... I mean, that's, like, obviously... Men are the gremlins in the internet? Mm I mean, you said it, and it's completely true. Like, I mean, there is, like, I mean, to me, that's, like, one of those great in-jokes is, like, man, dudes really do ruin the internet, don't they? Like, just <laughs> trolls. Dude, I humans. never thought of that. That's pretty true. Here's two ladies trying to have a conversation. Oh, Here's two ladies trying to have a conversation. Like, hey, hang on. fucker. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty. <laughs> I don't know. That's the only thing I could <laughs> pull from. That might be was... my favorite little sub take is, <laughs> men really ruin the internet, right? If that's what we take away from this film. If that's what we take away from it, I'm fine. If that's what men, the movie ends up being about is like, man, dudes ruined the internet. I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah. Hard to argue for sure. If you go on <laughs> it, literally any website. Um, okay. So we get to this, this finale, right? Again, I, I think this is rooted in an actual home invasion i th- okay. i think this this creep guy is coming in yeah that makes there, sense there no. is a small bit of quirkiness with how this plays out to me right is that we see the vagrant man cutting his head open and putting a leaf in right now he's looking more like that you know uh the green man grotesque or face yeah he's looking like so he has become this god entity right right not really a god, but he is the nature of the primordial nature of man, right? The most boiled down, basic, gross parts, right? Right. Cool. I'm with you on that. We start doing this teleportation of she sees other, you know, the other fucking white guys. All right, cool. This is, again, that PTSD thing. Every guy that's left a psychic injury on her, she's manifesting that, right? Right, right. There are a couple beats in here at the start of this. That as I think of this as an actual home invasion are a little quirky to me, right? The crow flies through the window, mm-hmm. and we see the crow with the plastic woman mask on. Yep. Right? To me, that is the I don't know if it's the albatross around the neck of having to be a woman. Is this I what did you make of that moment? Well, you assume the little the the boy Rory Kinnear put the mask over the. Crow. Is this him? Like, I'm going to bury my inner feminine side and just become this fucking. I will. That is that him defeating his no, own. I mean, I think it's nature? way less. No, I mean, I think it's way less symbolic. I th- or not way less symbolic. I think it's more. The crow crashes through the window. To me, putting the mask on the crow, is. It is the visual metaphor of how little boy Rory Kinnear sees her, which is as a an interloper. Oh, nice! I like that. So, like, there's something there's something to that. Like, it's such a fast thing, yeah. and like, it's just meant to like from a movie standpoint. It's meant to a get her, get her attention to get her into the kitchen again, and also scare the shit out of her. So, like, right. but to me, visually, it makes more sense that it would be like, oh, this is how he sees her, right? As, like you've crashed into this world that we're trying to. Yeah, because that's when he brings back the I want to play hide and seek. Yep. She goes to the other side of the door and she starts counting, right? Again, this is mm-hmm. the I'm not going to be fucking afraid moment. Um, Even though everyone in the audience is horrified at this point. I want to talk through, because we've already done the hand through the door, the hand gets sliced open, right? And this fucking gnarly just hand getting ripped. And they keep God showing damn, it. It's so dude. fucking gross. So gross. Fucking like rip my guts out gross, right? I was like, uh, 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 in the theater just losing yeah. it. That was the one I was like, you don't need to watch yeah. that, Andrea. Walk, walk me through when she's in that bathroom, right? Why is it the vicar that comes through for her? Oh, I mean, like, that's because it's 
he's the one who would do it. He's the one who would cross the line. Like all the rest of them. He comes are, in and starts this. This is your power. You put these right. thoughts in my mind and like groping or mid. All the rest of them have very visceral, violent reactions towards her. He's the only one who's actually spoken to her really, by the way, or sort of listened to her, however you want to interpret it. But he's the only one who's felt like he understands her inner, uh, her inner desires, her inner feelings what she's not putting out into the world. So to me, the reason it's the Vicar is because he's also someone who's forced to suppress his inner desires all the time. So for him to unleash that a has a, um, has a, as a visual metaphor, a has a great connotation of how fucked up the clergy is. And then also, yeah, again, it is the most, this is the close, like we, I've only felt uncomfort discomfort from a lot of these guys. This is the first time any of them have like sexually approached her in a way that's like pretty not okay. Why don't I say it like that? Not okay at yeah, all. I don't tremendously even know why. Tremendously okay. Tremendously not, right. not, tremendously not, okay. not okay. Yeah. Pretty it's is not horrible. the word. I, it's fucking it's horrible. It's fucking nasty. Yes. So he's the only one to approach her like that because he feels like he knows her. Like he has something on her. Like he owns he's the first one some sort of close. piece of her information. Yeah, the homeless guy gets close but not that he's the first one who physically right is well the homeless her. guy is not the homeless guy is this it this is the super ego trying to talk to her about what she wants yeah. and what she needs and these kinds of things and that is that is like to me this metaphor for mansplaining to women like oh no it's cool like i'm very i'm very nice but it like, feels I just, important though that when thing. she goes in that moment it is the head of the church who does totally. not have a great history of being decent to women throughout history, right? Right. Um, especially the guy who's running the church where we see these fertility symbols, right? Absolutely. Um, so part of me wondered if he was the fucking alpha Jeffy, and that's who we are seeing is because sure. she had that experience with the vicar somewhere else. Um, and he was the first one to kind of put that, no pun intended, fear of God in her. Um but yeah, his his assault in that it really is this vile thing that's happened. It still happens today in our cultures, right? Where, you know, we believe that people are created in the image of God, but yet are so afraid of women's reproductive abilities because that has sexual connotations. And that it's so fucking that scene just has so much power. And especially with the fucking hand when he puts his hand around her neck, the two fucking hands. Ugh. Holy shit. Oh, man. that was fucking gross. Gross. Dude. Fucking gross. Ugh. All right. Um, here's another right. small beat. When the hand reaches through We're the door, still slot, not going to talk about it. <laughs> she grabs the fucking hand. Yeah. It feels like she's grabbing it as in like, okay, I give up. But then is able to fucking, you know, chop this fucking hand in half. Right. Right. Hideous. Walk me through this. What is happening in the moment when she goes outside uh, Jeffrey's been like fucking taking care of whatever he's been dispatched. Right. The lights are going off. There's a lot of kind of teleporting around and mm-hmm. almost jump scary kind of stuff here. A little bit. Yeah. I think it's you, when you're recanting this night, right? That's like the PTSD flashbacks of it could have been any of these guys, right? Whatever. Sure. Walk me through this dandelion infestation. Oh. Yeah. His nature is taking a part of her. I'll be honest with you. You might have to walk me through that because, like, it was the exact opposite of what I thought was about to happen. Because what um, is really strange about that moment is it's obviously got a very seminal, 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 seminal uh, symbolism, right? This one little sure. dandelion, th- and that's what dandelions are, right? They're seeds that blow out and make more fucking dandelions, right? Fine. Right. The seed is planted in her, and it feels like the story shifts at this point. Okay, maybe. All right. And her friend that. being pregnant at the end, I was a little bit like, ah, oh, is she actually pregnant? Right. Okay. While this is That's happening, I- and we didn't know. But then she's drinking a fucking drink, so she doesn't feel like the character is gonna be like, yeah, I'll just get fucking hammered if I'm pregnant. Did she drink the drink? Although maybe she doesn't know she's pregnant. She yet. doesn't drink the drink at the bar. Well, she goes in to get one. She just wants to buy her own, but Jeffrey fucking right. cuts her up. Anyways. Well, she wants to buy her own. He, but like, no, but she never actually takes the. I don't think she, she doesn't because she's fucking accosted by this terrible news. But 
with that theory, that's not the worst idea. The the most cynical part of me wondered if that was the blood at the end when I was trying to figure all this out, that maybe all this stress and all this horrible stuff led to this like terrible miscarriage. Ooh. Um that is that is the most dark. like cynical, horrible theory I was having when the movie was unfolding. Because her friend yeah, was that's pregnant. Some da- I'll say this. That is some dark shit. Yeah. However, that also tracks. Well, because this is the thing that kind of led me down this train. And I'm not sure I I accept this own idea I was having. After the, the little dandelion gets in the body, right? Right. It does lead to a birth, but of Pan, right? So Pan starts... Just, just fucking. Give up. I mean, there, there's this birthing scene that is graphic just, and brutal. I actually thought it was cool. I read that Alex Garland had a different version of this. Yeah, I saw that. And then too. he, he was like, he was inspired by Attack on Titan, which is just a fucking rad show, man. And the, the Titans in that show had these hideous body horror moments. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, it's this, it's this rolling birth as I've heard it described now, where Pan gives birth to. One of the men we've seen. That man then through his Isn't back kid? or his butt or his wherever Man-gina. on his body. Yeah, yeah. Things start they just start giving birth and kind of following her in so through the house. Once is tw- so it's two times through the mangina. One is in the once dead where back. he just once just an explosion out of the back. And then the last one, which gives birth to James, mm-hmm. is through the through Jeffrey's mouth. Yeah, where the dandelion answered, yeah. A weed, right. a dandelion's a weed, too. This is my theory. <laughs> when she's, because the creature that we've seen this entire assault has the same injuries we saw as Jeffrey on the fence. Yeah, he's got the broken her. leg. He, yeah, oh my and God. The, uh, when they did that the broken arm. leg, oh. I Blah. can't do broken bones at all. You know what's and fascinating? the hand is the same as when it's caught on the post. You know what's funny is that they did that wide shot of James in the pole and the leg was broken i'm like this is gonna come up on the pod <laughs> oh you could you could show me people fucking birthing full-grown men all day i'd watch a hundred of those in a row i don't want to <laughs> see a broken anything like right. a bro- bone snapping sound is my nightmare here here's my theory though right so all of these men right these toxic versions of men are giving birth to other versions of toxic men all right pretty easy symbolism i can understand right that their base nature keeps proliferating all right right when james comes out of the the last white guy i don't know if it was jeffrey or the vicar that james comes out of right it's jeffrey so her specific man who has tormented her comes out of this this you know last version of the the country white guy that's been oppressing her right Mm -hmm. all right he comes up and he starts his little thing right like you know he's kind of haunting her this and that She's pretty nonchalant about all of it. Yeah. And he, she just says, what do you want from me? And he says, I want your love. And she almost gives us like, just like a little smirk. Like, are you fucking kidding me? The idea of that to me being is that she sees all these toxic men that represent these patriarchal forces that have given birth to her specific man who hurt her. And he wants her love still after the grave, this and that, right? There's blood everywhere on the door and on her. Is she afraid because she has James inside of her still? And she's worried about what the emotional toll of that will be. You know, that he still wants her love, but all she'll see is this guy. I don't know. That that to me was a little cloud. And I don't think the costuming backs that up the next day when she's sitting outside on the step. Mm-hmm. for a miscarriage but that was kind of my thought because that ending threw me for a loop a little bit right when you know what do you want your love and she just laughs because part of me says that's just the you know the kind of final flourish of the movie is that we think what we want is their love what we want is their subjugation sure we want to well, love think, ourselves and we have to use them to, to make that, that point happen. though that to me was what the laugh was about which is you don't know what you want. Like that to me yeah. is always the thing about that to me is exactly what Jesse Buckley is dealing with the entire end of the movie is like for her not to be like horrified by what she's just seen. Yeah. 
particularly that her dead husband hobbles over and simply says, all I want is your love. Mm -hmm. Like she knows it's bullshit. I think that's like the thing that I love the most about her reaction is that the level of it is so her nonchalantness to the entire fiasco is so telling. It's just like, you don't know what you want. I don't don't have time to fit. I don't have time or the inclination to figure it out. I think that's, that's honestly the part. That's honestly the part that I thought was, even though it was fucking nuts, what preceded it. Yeah. That was the most engaging and captivating way to end that scene, which is like simply saying, <laughs> you have yeah. no fucking idea what you're asking. There's not a lot of landing points after the rolling birth. Um, yeah. But not only that, right? When he says that line, what I thought was funny about it is like, I bet that's what she wanted to hear back in the red room. It's like, I Absolutely. want your love. I'll do whatever it takes. Like, Tell me, I'm sorry, I fucking like blew it. Now, after doing yeah. all this, now this after is, well, hitting you, you and threatening you and trying to guilt you and you know harming myself so that you have to be tarred with that, now you want to say you love me, right? Um, again, I think wrapping this thing up, right? I don't. This is a movie. I saw this on Friday. We're recording this on Monday evening. I haven't come to grips with this yet. I still don't I know either. what I think all of it means. There are things that feel like I have a really good read on them. And then I match it with another scene in the movie and I feel completely lost again. Right? Yeah. What I think is awesome is the fact that I got to go watch this movie and sit and think and feel yeah. on that magnitude. Period. So many movies right. nowadays are so afraid to not lay it out. Follow the saves the cat. Don't leave us with questions because that makes your average audience member upset right. if they feel like they're not – the movie's trying to tell them they're not smart enough to get it, right? right. I, I think what Alex Garland did is that he made a movie that will confound the mind in a great way, right? Like there's just so much yeah. to process and so many ways to take everything. It reminded me of that documentary Room 237, right? We all watch oh, yeah. the same movie, but you can find 800 things in it. But what I think is through his care and his precision and his craft, he laid out these wonderful visuals and symbols and emotion. You feel the weight of the dread and the emotion so fucking heavy that your brain doesn't have time to process. So when the movie comes, it's like a fucking tidal wave of what the fuck did I just watch? Right. And I just think that experience is something I really cherish. Uh, in a movie i fucking love my time watching this movie yeah i mean again how often do we go to the theater and walk out and say i'm so glad i have like four thousand questions for this movie like yeah well i was excited to do this right (laughs) it's rare that we walk out of a theater and watch a movie like not like watch a movie that's trying to do this or trying like when you and i ask questions about movies a lot of the time we're asking like really logical questions that don't get answered in films. Yeah. What's so nice and refreshing about seeing men is walking out of the theater, knowing full well, Alex Garland intends everyone to have this kind of conversation more than once. Yeah. More than once should this conversation be had. I had a conversation with my wife on Sunday. I'm having this conversation with you today. Mm -hmm. Whoever else sees it at this point, I'm going to talk about it and be like, dude, this is what I think the movie is. Yeah. And also, could this has already changed my perception of what the movie is. And I think that's what is so great about it. Same. Like, I came in and I told you before we started, I'm like, I don't have this thing like sorted in my brain. Not even close. But I think this is one of those when you're out at a function or whatever and someone is. You hear someone like, oh, I saw men. You're like, fuck, yeah. Like, let's, let's talk. And that's the thing. I think so many movies forget this, like, the basic power of movies over so many other mediums is you just have so many fucking tools at your disposal, right? To fucking make, to just pull fucking a deep yeah. well of feeling from us. And yeah. so many movies, they just get so worried about explaining every detail. It just bogs down that feeling. And if art, at a very core, the art, whatever it is, the first thing it should elicit is a strong emotional response. Of course. If it's not doing that, it's not doing its job. It's nice to see right. a well-told, complete story, right? Like, I'm not mad that Lord of the Rings doesn't have an ambiguous birth where, you know, 
Frodo gives birth to Sam, who gives birth to fucking Gimli and whatever. You know, Lord of the Rings is pretty cut and dry. Like, here it is. <laughs> get some Bible shit. Done. Love that, yeah. too. But I think what has happened is so many of these kind of movies. These aren't movies that are just art house and weird for the sake of it. But right. the fact that you I use think, your craft to make something this abstract. I think that's the trick of a movie like Men. And that's what a lot of other movies like it fell short on is you're being odd for odd's sake. I don't feel like I'm being. It's not like it's the opposite of being pandered to. Like, yeah, what I like about this movie is to simply say, like, what do you think? Like, <laughs> I made this move like Alex Garland. I I, I tweeted this. I, I put, put a fucking Instagram about it. like Alex Garland literally made a movie. Says, I don't give a fuck about what the audience thinks. I'm going to make the movie I want to make. Right. And then you guys can fucking take it and run with it. Like, yeah. this is the kind of movie that people will write dissertations about because yeah. there is no defiant ending to it. And. Yeah, like there's great storytelling to be done, but that's what makes men so good mm -hmm. is that the definitiveness that's lacking about men is that thing is the thing that it's probably its greatest strength. Mm -hmm. I I love that. I loved it. Yeah. I had a great time watching it. Like this this what else feels do you need, like man? the top shelf version of what mother wanted to be. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a good way to put it. Because Mother tried this, but it just got a little too messy in its own way and just didn't do it for me. This is like that perfect blend of image and haunting sound and um, context clues and symbols, right? Just weird. It feels I, like you're walking through someone else's nightmare for most of it. I um, know that if I talk to like three other people about this movie, I'll have a different conversation with every single one of them. That yeah. is a powerful thing to yeah. come out of a movie. That's a great. It has a cinema movie. score of D plus, by the way. This is another great example. I mean, Don't on. read reviews by people. Well, just go see the movie. When I see this or Lamb in the theater, there are just some movies where I'm like, come the fuck on. Just if you make movies. a movie like Men <laughs> or Lamb or whatever you shouldn't even go into cinema score grading like that should just you shouldn't even out. be looking at rotten tomatoes for movies like men yeah. like just go this to the movie is theater. not made for just the uh, wandering you know so and so like i got a free afternoon yes. you know we just got done at banana republic and i want to catch some popcorn in the dark and the air conditioning let's go who's that guy with the mustache who used to review movies for new york gene shallow uh, gene, gene Gene Shallot. Yeah, I'm just thinking about Gene Shallot but watching this movie. Gene Shallot would fucking love this movie. No. He would be a fucking huge fan of men. I'm just saying, like, my uncles aren't going to just happen in on men and enjoy no. that. This is a movie that requires from you, and it'll feel really uncomfortable. The fact that this has a bad cinema score and is lukewarm at the box office. Probably means it's, it means it's awesome. Also, it's the least fucking surprising news I've ever heard in my life. This Agreed. will be a movie that when it gets out to where people can watch it easily, streaming service at home, uh, you know, VOD where they can really engage with it. They can watch it a couple times. Absolutely. You can Google while you're watching it. This movie is going to be a cult classic. I, I am convinced 100% of that. Um, I don't disagree. That's it for men. We've had enough. We can't take no mo. That's enough of you, man. Yeah, that's it. Uh, guys, thank you for doing this with us. We're very excited to talk about uh, these awesome new movies that are coming up. Some of them we've already missed when they hit VOD. We'll be jumping in on that. So something we're excited to add to the repertoire here. Next month, the pod kneels before Griffey, worships his birth, and theme. presents gifts Not the name of the month. to his oiled up great pod. Okay. That's not going to fit in our graphic, but we'll work on it. Smaller fonts. Nope. <laughs> the pod follows its true North Star to the one. See that? The, no. I'll, 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 we'll workshop it. <laughs> I'll figure it out. Sure. I'll figure it out. But yeah, movies that have been gifted to yours truly for the month of my birth. It's an awesome list. You guys are going to be really excited. It we is have very awesome good. stuff coming up on Patreon, exclusive episodes, commentaries. Tales from the Crypt miniseries, lots of cool stuff. So, again, that's patreon.com slash pod. Go over there and check us out, guys. Little is a dollar a month. You get in. Help the show out. It means the world to us. 
Uh, make sure you leave rating and reviews wherever you find the show. You can email us, filmalchemistpod at gmail.com. Subscribe to the YouTube, Film Alchemist. Uh, find us on, on socials, guys. We're easy to get a hold of. We love to hear from you. Uh, for the Film Alchemist, I'm Josh Griffey. That's it, man. I got nothing else. I'm Alex Dandino, the only one, I think.